Today is Palm Sunday, and we've been moving through the Gospel of Mark, so we're going to quantum leap to chapter 11, and then after life groups, we will come back to chapter 4, Palm Sunday being the first day of the Holy Week, is either on Sunday or Monday. Scholars are torn between this. And to be honest, I, as I look at the evidence, I, I kind of lean more towards Palm Monday. But for history and tradition, we will celebrate it today. It's a day when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And when you read the accounts, it's in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You look at this simple, small story, and it can seem like there's, there's, there's not a lot of weight or significance to it, especially 2,000 years later when the cultural gap is wide. John's account in John's gospel can, can help give us a little bit of understanding, and, and this is the account that, that Blake read at the beginning of our worship service this morning. I want you to listen to verses 12 through 16 because I want to capture probably the most significant part of the story. And it's a part that we oftentimes miss with modern ears. John says, the next day a large crowd had come to the feast and had heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Underline that in your Bible. So they took palm branch branches from palm trees, and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. You may not fully understand the context of that, but it's a, it's a, it's a power statement. In this fairly simple story, Jesus enters Jerusalem, we see a lot of people excited, calling him king, bringing palm branches, hence that's why it's called Palm Sunday or Monday. Jesus gets on a donkey and rides into town. But, but what is so significant about this event? I think the phrase, Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, historically, when you close the gaps, carries a lot of weight, and, and around that sentence are other clues that I'm hoping to unpack this morning. Remember, Jerusalem was and still is the central city of Judaism. It was where all the powerful Jewish leaders were. Jesus, as we've learned early in Mark, claimed to be the prophesied king of God's kingdom, the son of God. He claimed to be able to forgive sins. He was healing and doing miraculous things. This statement going to Jerusalem, which is recorded in all the Gospels, is a bold statement. It's a statement of danger. Jesus and his disciples, they knew it. There was a key moment right before chapter 11 in, in chapter 10, and so you can look over, I'm going to reference this real, real quick, chapter 10 verses 32 and 34, where, where Jesus begins to move towards Jerusalem. And we see that his disciples are shocked that they're going into Jerusalem, and they're scared. Verse 
Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 32, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. He's talking about himself. This had to alarm those that were following him. And we know Peter didn't like it. At one point, he takes matters into his own hand. Jesus says, they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Jesus is going to Jerusalem in order to be captured. He's going there to die. He's going there to be resurrected from the death. He's going there to to bring life. How's he going to do it? He's going to bring life through death. This is what John Owens, the great Puritan, called in his book, The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. He's going to Jerusalem to be the death of death in the life of life. And on Friday, we will reflect deeply on the death of death. And on Sunday, a week from today, we will celebrate resurrection, the life of life. But today, I want you to see God's authoritative word recording these events in Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. You've heard John's account Now, through public reading of Scripture, I want to invite you to stand and listen to the very words of God that inspired Mark to recount these details, verse 1 through 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you. And immediately, as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied to a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told him what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road. And others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields And those who went before and those who followed after were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, He went out to Bethany with the twelve. As we move through these verses this morning, point by point, may God be blessed. May our hearts be transformed. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are humbled and grateful for what you did for us on the cross. We confess you as Lord knowing that you were pierced for our transgressions. You were crushed for our iniquities, as the Scriptures say. This punishment, Lord, that you took brings 
peace to all who believe. Lord, as we move through Passion Week, will you fill our hearts and minds over the next seven days with a boasting in you and in the cross. Each day allow us to have deep reflection, to deepen our faith, and to allow our love for you to be strengthened in the truth of who you are and what you've done to redeem sinners back to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Mark's hope, my goal this morning is for you to understand the significance of the triumphal entry and for you to understand this in a personal way. That this isn't just information about a historical event that did happen, that was documented outside of Scripture. You've heard me say that this, this week... In, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the most historically documented event in human history. This week changes the course of human history, even the calendar. So what? The goal is to understand, and I, I hope at a deeper, maybe a new level for some of us, the significance of the triumphal entry Jesus Going into Jerusalem, Sinclair Ferguson states, in regards to the importance of this week, every schoolboy, he says, is supposed to know Julius Caesar's famous words before he crossed the river Rubicon. The die is cast. It means a point of no return has been reached. This was true now for Jesus. There's no turning back. Now his last days had arrived. The climactic activity of his life, the pinnacle of his life, is about to begin. Historians tell us that the population of Jerusalem at this time is about 800,000 people. But during Passover week, between 2 to 3 million people would crowd into the city for a celebration. People came to Jerusalem with anticipation that God was going to do something amazing. They knew the Old Testament prophecies. They knew the Messiah was coming. They knew that God was going to save. And they had a mental model, so to speak, on how this was going to transpire. People came looking for God to do something. And this Passover, 2,000 years ago, God would do his greatest work, but most people would miss it altogether and still miss it to this very day. Jesus had entered the city many times before, but this one was going to be different. On this day, Jesus was coming to fulfill the promises of God Jesus was coming to redeem God's people for all eternity. He was coming to do what he said he was going to do. Save sinners like you and me. And so Mark wants his readers to understand the significance of Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem. Realizing that in just five days the crucifixion would take place. And so as we look at this, Mark is going to allow us to see how calm the Lord is. He's going to give careful details concerning Jesus entering the holy city, a city that was deceitful, a temple that was corrupted. But Zechariah chapter 9-9 was going to be fulfilled, that prophecy, and we're going to see that. What I hope that you do is walk away with five elements of his entrance. And you see, in context, these five elements. This is why we move verse by verse, point by point, so that you see this with your own eyes. Verse 1, we see the first element. 
There is a request from the one who is always in control. We see a request in verses 1 through 3 from the sovereign God himself, Jesus, who is God. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples. You need to understand, before they get to Jerusalem, they're in Jericho, and it's quite a hike to get from Jericho to Jerusalem. And they've, they've gotten to the edge. And Jesus sends two of his disciples. Verse 2, he says to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will enter it and find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. He's giving, Mark's giving us important details of this entrance into Jerusalem. Untie it, he says, and bring it. If anyone says to you, where are you, why, uh, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And we'll send it back here immediately. You see this request, this, this command to go, it's in the present imperative, which they promptly obeyed. Even though they did not fully understand, as we read in John chapter 12, they still obeyed. When, when Jesus tells us to go, we, we need to obey without hesitation, without doubting, without questioning. The disciples go, and, and they find the cult just as Jesus had told them. Because he's God and he can foresee, because he's sovereign, he knows what's going on. Some scholars would say that he had prearranged it. This doesn't hold water. There's no way Jesus prearranged it. I wonder if these same scholars, and I read quite a bit on this, believe that Jesus prearranged the fish having a coin in its mouth to pay the temple tax for Peter. He went to the, he, come here, fish. Um, here, put this in and we'll be back. And, no. No, the, these points that the writers, the historical writers are making are to show us Jesus is not normal. He's God incarnate. They find the cult on which this detail no one had ever sat. They untied it and they brought it. R.C. Sproul helps to shed some light on this. And it is recorded in the Old Testament, unused animals were oftentimes suited and picked out for sacred purposes. We see this in Numbers chapter 19, Deuteronomy 21, and I believe in 1 Samuel. Animals being set apart, unbroken for sacred purposes. And Sprawl says donkeys, just like horses, usually had to be broken in to become functional beasts of burden. And that's what they were called. Yet the principle in the Jewish culture was that no one was allowed to ride on a king's horse or a king's donkey. Only the king could ride his beast, Sproul says. This is why Jesus specifically asked for a colt that had never been ridden. It was a colt that was prepared for a king. If anyone says to you, Jesus tells them, why are you doing this? Say the Lord has need of it. That is a shocking statement. The disciples had to be going, okay, wait, wait hold on a second. You want us to go into the city, find a colt tied to a house, and steal it. And if somebody says, what are you doing? Say, the Lord has need of it. I couldn't imagine what it's like to be a disciple. But they had seen Jesus do some amazing things. And we see that they listened to this commission and they obeyed. Notice he says, tell them the Lord has need of it. There, there's a little comedy here, not just 
go and, 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 and borrow the donkey. Say, we'll return it when we're done. But the, but the Lord, the king, has need of it. It's a pretty amazing statement when you think about the divinity of Jesus being God. God doesn't need anything. He owns everything. But we see all throughout Scripture, Jesus, despite the fact that he's God, he takes on human form. He doesn't leave his deity, but he takes on human form. We don't fully understand this. He's 100% God and 100% man, but in his humanity, he still experiences things that he needs, food and, and other aspects. He walked on water, but he's got to borrow a donkey to ride. There's so many paradoxes in this. I could list. I may have a long list, but I'm going to save you the time. So we see in the first three verses a request from the one who is sovereign over all. And then we see a response from those who believe the word of God who believed Jesus' words in verse, verses 4 to 6. And they went away and found the colt tied at the door outside the street, and they untied it. They went and they obeyed the word. This was their response. Jesus says, go, and they went. And everything happened exactly how he said. Brothers and sisters, this morning, I just want you to know, Jesus and his promises, God and his promises record in the word. They will happen exactly how he says. They went and they found. Verse 5 says, And some of those standing outside said, What are you doing untying the colt? We're stealing it because Jesus needs No, that's not what they said. They said the Lord has need of it. I want to remind you of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. He works all things according to his will. This is Jesus. This is all throughout the New Testament. It's all throughout the Old Testament. The sovereignty of God, his promises will stand. Our response needs to be obedience. And obedience comes out of true and authentic belief in God's promises. Some were standing and said, what are you doing? Luke identifies these bystanders as the owners of the cult. He, of the, I didn't say cult, I said cult. <laughs> I had to check myself there. They were the owners. It adds a, a, Luke's a physician, so he always gives a, a little bit more detail in his writings. They owned it. It was theirs. And they told him what Jesus had said, and these owners let them go. Jesus gives a, a command, and, and they respond with obedience. And then we see in 7 through 8, there's this respect to the one, Jesus, who exemplifies humility. And they brought the colt, verse 7, to Jesus. And through their cloaks on it, there's this respect for Jesus as he humbles himself and he sits on the colt. Why? The question now is, did Jesus enter Jerusalem on a colt? I, I wonder if they, they, they were wondering why it wasn't a horse. In the ancient world, including Israel, one of the privileges of king was to be taken, I used this word earlier, I'm going to use it again because it's the historical word, to, to take a beast of burdens whenever the king or ruler needed it. And as king, Jesus exercised his right in the culture and commanded disciples to get the colt. The donkey was, the donkey is something that is, was very deliberate by Jesus. Deliberate because the prophet Zechariah had spoke 
And given this picture, hundreds of years before saying that the king would come riding a donkey, a colt, Zechariah 9, verses 9 through 11, listen to the prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he. He's coming to save. He is the righteous ruler, the king. Humbled, Zechariah says, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt the fowl of a donkey. This is a picture of a king. You and I wouldn't catch that picture, but the disciples, understanding the the Old Testament prophecies, they would have understood at at a base level, beyond what we could ever understand, what exactly is going on. This is a picture definitely of a king a righteous and victorious king. His rule will be extended to the ends of the earth. He will bring peace to all the nations of the world and freedom from those who were enslaved and imprisoned in their minds by the Roman rule. This is victory. This is the emotion they're experiencing but it is not as they expected. Jesus' victory doesn't appear as strength or political power. He is a Jewish rabbi. There is absolutely no hint of nationalism here. There is a whole new level of humility and humbleness that he is showing You don't and you can't go into battle on a donkey. You can't destroy the Roman Empire on a donkey. You can't fight your way to the throne and destroy all your enemies that are in your way on a donkey. Only Eddie Murphy thinks you can do that. That was in my notes. I thought of that in my office all by myself. I wasn't sure I'd get a laugh, but you had to throw a little Shrek joke in there, right? Zach, it's okay. He's afraid. He never watched Shrek. He's afraid. It's okay, buddy. That wasn't in the notes. Verse 8. Verse 8. Here we go. Back at it. Focus, Andy. Verse 8. And many spread out their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields, a palm branch, a symbol in the ancient world of triumph and victory. In the Roman culture, they were awards these palm branches for champions in games and in celebration for military success. Sinclair Ferguson, again, gives a great insight. Think for a moment what Mark's record would convey to those who first read his book, Christians from the first century in Rome. No doubt many of them had seen generals enter Rome in triumph to receive the accolades of victory How stark the contrast between Roman glory and Jesus, Jesus' humility must have seemed between the two. How mighty and powerful the sword and political power by contrast with King Jesus. Sinclair goes on and says, yet we know that it was Jesus' kingdom that was established. While the glory that was Rome's disappeared into oblivion, Rome is no longer the superpower in the world. We know that what Jesus did in Jerusalem established a kingdom which outlasts all kingdoms of this world and breaks into pieces every man-centered kingdom which sets itself against Jesus. Jesus is coming to take his throne. 
but had committed himself to begin his reign on the cross. Rome fell. God's kingdom and his church is prevailing still 2,000 years later. Do you know what the blame is for Rome's fall? Christianity. In the historical books, you can read it. Christianity killed Rome. It's not true. Augustine began to write a few hundred years later about the fall of Rome in his three-part book called The City of God. He wrote it, it started writing it in A.D. 413. This is three years after Rome fell. And he labored over it for 13 years. You don't have to read it, but if you want a good read, go for it. It's a pretty heavy volume. It took him 12 years to write. But he breaks down historically what caused Rome to fall. There was a walk away from absolute truth. There is no absolute truth. There was a walk away from morals. Your truth and your morality is yours. There was a brokenness in the family. There was a mix-up and a, a complete confusion over sexual morality. Those five things deconstructed the whole power from the inside out. Sound familiar? And all I can say in regards to that is God's kingdom prevails. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church. A church that stands on the truth of God's word, that understands that there is a will of God and a will of man. And those two things are enemies. And we are all born into sin and broken. But God transforms us. It all started this week, 2,000 years ago. You see, verses 9 to 10 give a reaction. The crowd gives a reaction. They give a reaction, even though they didn't fully understand, to the one, the only one who saves. And those, verse 9, who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, this is a, a key word. It, it is a simple transliteration from a Hebrew word, save us now. I could, I could break it down for you. It's, it's really an interesting word. But to save time, I just want you to know it means save us now. It occurs in 2 Samuel. It occurs in 2 Kings. It's used in context by people seeking help and protection from the hands of a king. They are right. What they're saying, they, they don't fully understand. What's coming out of their lips is right, but they don't fully understand it in their hearts. They're shouting Hosanna. It is not a cry of praise to Jesus. Don't misunderstand this. It was a cry to God to break in and save his people. Now that the Messiah has come, they didn't understand how he was going to save, but they knew God was going to save. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 10. Blessed is the kingdom of of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. Mark uses the word twice. Hosanna in the highest. Mark alone repeats these great words. Not just talking about highest degree, but highest place, heaven, the very heavens. This is a statement of the sovereign God. Like I said, the crowds were right. They were right to praise Jesus as king, for that's who he is. They were right to say, Hosanna, it means Lord, save us now. 
because that's what he came to do. They were right to expect that he would come to Jerusalem to establish his kingdom. He's doing it. And to reconcile people back to God. They were simply wrong in how they expected that he would do it. Still to this day, there are people in churches, in ours and all over the world, who are missing the point. of why Jesus came. And then Mark in verse 11 gives one last essential element that he wants us to understand before the rest of the week begins to play out. He wants to remember that Jesus being sovereign is the one who sees everything. And he entered Jerusalem. First thing he does is he goes into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. After he rode into Jerusalem with all the swarms of people following, he enters. They're all cheering. And at the end of this entrance, It seems that Mark is saying everything has calmed down and all the crowds have now dissipated. He enters the temple and it's late in the day, so it's quiet and the courts are empty. You see, in Mark's description, there's a tone here and the tone shifts from from praising Jesus. Mark's tone shifts to this sorrow in the scene. The scene in the temple. Jesus looks around at everything. Most scholars believe there is deep contemplation that Mark is talking about, and and all the Gospels writers talk about it. Jesus is reflecting on a couple of things. He's reflecting on the last time he was in the temple and how corrupt it was. How things were so distant from the heart and will of God. The church had become a pragmatic smorgasbord of entertainment and merchandise sales, so to speak. And he's also reflecting on what is getting ready to transpire, starting with the temple. The words looking around at everything, they mean looking comprehensively, not missing anything, looking with insight and infinite wisdom. He saw the corruption that had been carried out in the temple. He sees and and, and reflects on hearts and motives as he gets ready to walk this path to the cross. Where was the crowd now. What happened to all the excitement and expectation? What were the disciples thinking? Let me ask a question. In in reflecting on verse 11, this reminder of the one who sees everything, What would Jesus see if he walked into Sun River Church right now? Just asking that question myself gets me spinning in my own heart. What would he see as he looks around your temple, your heart, your life? He knows what's on the inside. There's nothing he doesn't know. What does he see? You see, Jesus being God, this is, this is what, what we have to grapple with. This is truth of what Scripture teaches. Jesus 
being God in that moment 2,000 years ago, because he's God and he can operate outside of time, space, and matter, that he's not confined by, by limited knowledge, he sees and he knows that while you and I are his enemy, he's going to the cross to die for those who believe in him. This forces us, as we look at this small story at the beginning of Holy Week, to ask a foundational question. As we looked at the context, let's now look to an application, which is something we try to do every Sunday. We see the request, we see the response, we see the respect, the reaction, and a reminder. So let me ask this question as we begin this week. Has the king, King Jesus, had a triumphal entry in your life? A a saving entry into your life? Don't, Don't let this information just be information in your head. These things really happen, and Jesus is is giving us an account of why he went to Jerusalem and what's beginning to transpire. And at the end of the day, the question is, is has he had an authentic, some scholars and pastors say this is an unauthentic, triumphal entry. And for a lot of people, it's the same. Jesus has had an unauthentic entry into their life. They are still king They want all the perks, they want all the blessings, they want to go to heaven when they die, but they want to live their life the way they want, on their terms, which is outside the will of God. It doesn't work that way. Jesus came to save sinners and transform. Jesus paid the price for death and killed and conquered sin and death through the resurrection to give you new life in Christ. There is a request outside the context of Mark 11, inside the context of Scripture and Jesus' words. There's a request from the one who is always in control. It's in Romans 10. If you confess, these are all if statements. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. God was in control of that. There's a response to those who believe the word of God. If you love me, you will keep my commands. Jesus exemplifies humility. And there's a respect for the one who exemplifies humility. it's, It's something we embrace. If want to save his life, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my name's sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? This stirs up a reaction to the one who saves. I've said it and I'll say it again. That reaction is to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Remembering that Jesus sees everything. He's the one that said, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow. And in Psalm 139, this was the prayer. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I hope you see the significance of this entry into Jerusalem. Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy and all the promises of God that he came to save and to rescue. He's going to the cross to save and rescue you and I and then be raised from the dead three days later. You see, what this causes us to do is with real hearts, not like the crowd, but like we looked at in Mark chapter 3 a few weeks ago, the called. Don't sing Hosanna in the highest as the crowd. 
I want to invite you right now to stand as we close and sing together as those called by God, saved by God to sing Hosanna in the highest.